Today's show is brought to you by the Davenant Institute. Well, welcome back to the uh, Ironic Protestant podcast. Um, we're here today uh, to talk about the Davin Institute's uh, new book, Protestant Social Teaching. And we have joining us today, uh, the rector of Christ Church Anglican South Bend, uh, Stephen Wedgworth. How's it going? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back, guys. Uh, good to see y'all. Yeah. So you're, our, you're our first repeating guest. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And then we're here also with Jordan and, and Josh and Matthew um, again is avoiding the Reverend Redworth and saying he didn't want to be here. So, um, no, he just, he has class today. Um, and so he's been, he's been a good student. Uh, but yeah, so we're talking about uh, Protestant social teaching. Um, so let me begin by asking. Um, so I think by now, and the book's been out for a little, little over a month now, and you've been on quite a few podcasts with Brad and talking about the book and you probably have given this uh, same spiel a few times now, uh, but if you could uh, give us what what is Protestant social teaching uh, one, and then uh, why did you feel that now was a good time uh, to compile a, a book on Protestant social teaching? Yeah, so the title Protestant social teaching is kind of meant to surprise you because it's not an expression that had been terribly common. In fact, what most people are expecting is they're expecting Catholic social teaching. And that is widely talked about in the literature. Um, there are books by that title uh, here in South Bend. Of course, we have the University of Notre Dame. Uh, they teach classes on Catholic social teaching. And the idea seems to be out there that, well, there really wasn't a Protestant one. And um, because there wasn't a Protestant one, then modernity and secularism just filled the gap. And now if you want to have some way to be an intelligent Christian that has a comprehensive outlook, uh, then you need to go to something like Catholic social teaching. That, that was sort of the problem that we were encountering. And we wanted to argue that um, that's not really the right perspective on history. Uh, there is a fairly coherent and unified body of thinking when it comes to morals and social issues and even politics that you can identify across the broad range of the Protestant Reformation. And so we use that word Protestant to be broad. We're including Lutherans, we're including all of the continental reformed. We are including the Anglicans. And we are even trying to hold open the door, however uh, politely we can, for you know, later evangelical iterations. And so uh, Baptists are welcome with some strings attached, <laughs> uh, Methodist and other sorts of American evangelicals, um, so long as they're willing to connect into the current existing tradition. So that was the general idea here. We wanted to get that message out, that this exists. And then we wanted to show from the records, <laughs> you know, we're not making this up. This isn't, uh, I had a cool idea and stitched it together. I want to show you that, oh, here it is. You can see it in Luther. You can see it in Calvin. You can see it uh, in the 16th, 17th, 18th century into Kuiper. It's even still there with people like Bart and Bonhoeffer, uh, even that, though they're getting on the fringes. So that's the burden of the book. Um, and it's separated according to topics. So each contributor writes about a topic and they try to bring that Protestant historical perspective to the topic. And uh, why, why did y'all feel the need to for, for this book now in this current context? Yeah, so there's the high-flying sort of humanitarian answer. Oh, we want to really be a help for you guys. We want to equip people. We want to speak to the moment. And then there's my, uh, my personal answer. I just think that a lot of times we write books that only theologians and seminary students care to read. 
<laughs> it's all just philosophy and metaphysics and ins and outs of minutia. And here we have a whole body of stuff that could be really practical. This could be something that a lot of different kinds of people might want to read. Um, educated lay people. This is not going to be a Barnes and Noble paperback. We're not that silly with it. But hopefully you could give this to a ruling elder. You could give this to a lay person on your vestry, a deacon, just someone with probably an undergrad education who's interested in this stuff. And these topics would immediately strike them as something they care about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Well, today, I think we talked about, we wanted to uh, discuss two of the uh, essays uh, in the book. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, Eric Hutchinson wrote uh, the first chapter of the book on the law and the Christian and kind of talking about a Protestant um, understanding of the law. And I think, um, I mean, we, we, we've all received the book. We've all read it. I think this is the one uh, the three of us have probably talked about the most. Um, and uh, what I thought off the bat, what I thought was interesting about it is that he, he really comes at it uh, from a Lutheran perspective. My understanding, he, he is a Lutheran, right? <laughs> yes, poor, uh, poor Dr. Hutchinson. We were mm -hmm. unable to keep him in the Reformed fold, but uh, he, he was formerly a uh, Presbyterian years ago. But contrary to the rumors, we don't lose people to Catholicism. No, no, <laughs> we lost one to Lutheranism. So yeah, uh, my good friend learned so much from him, love him to death. But yeah, Eric uh, Hutchinson has become a Lutheran. And so his essay is very much a Lutheran essay. <laughs> and I thought that's what I, that's probably what I enjoyed the most about the essay, having read um, <clears throat> primarily reformed sources like, uh, cool like, like Turretin, like Calvin on, on the law and the idea of law. Uh, and it, it, to come at it from a, a Lutheran perspective, especially looking at Melanchthon, uh, it was really interesting to see the similarities um, in his discussion of the law. Um, and he, he, he kind of talks about, you know, the, the general uses of, of the law and theology, uh, but he, he comes around to eventually talking about uh, the three uses of the law. And what I found to be very surprising is um, I know the Lutherans might order the three uses a bit differently than the Reformed would, but the typical Reformed um, articulation of the third use where the law is the example for the Christian life, it seems like it's, a, it's an icky uh, use of the law for a lot of modern Lutherans, and he seems to speak about it uh, quite positively. I think he refers to it as the second use of the law, though. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and off, off the bat, uh, I thought it was interesting. Uh, because I think it showed kind of the degree of continuity uh, between the Lutheran and the Reformed, where me reading this as a Reformed person, it didn't sound all that different from what I had read before regarding uh, the uses of the law. But that was, that was probably one of the first things that jumped out to me um, about reading this chapter. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, in the probably sometime in the 19th century, but definitely by the 20th century, you had a real drive on both parties, Lutheran and Reform, to argue that they were so different, right? These are just totally different strands. In fact, um, you know, friend of mine, so to speak, from online, but I disagree with him on this. Uh, the Lutheran satire creator, Hans uh, Feeney, um, he's got this thing about Zwingli, right? Where he says he's got a whole cartoon about Zwingli and how they, they piggybacked on the Lutheran Reformation and then just stole it and destroyed it and were just totally off the rails. Now, whatever we think about Zwingli, uh, that's a whole interesting conversation. There's no way that that perspective holds for Calvin, for Bullinger, for Cranmer, for Sinus. It just, it, you, can't, you can't defend that kind of a distinction. Uh, Bootser and Melanchthon are two great examples. You know, Bootser is signing documents which are considered to be Lutheran confessional documents. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, Melanchthon, uh, Calvin is writing letters to Melanchthon. In fact, I think there's a letter after Melanchthon has already died where Calvin, like, calls out to his spirit, you know, oh, Melanchthon, if, if only you were here. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, there's a ton of overlap between these guys. And when you start trying to prove, okay, where do they disagree? 
it's only on maybe two places, three places, you know, I mean, the Lord's Supper, that's obvious. That's where they're really coming to blows. Um, and then partly on baptism, though that depends on the shade and the variety. Um, but after that, it's probably like the level to which they'll tolerate uh, political rebellion. You know, that, that's, that's, yeah. that's like the last thing that you can really see a difference. Um, and then that's it. They just agree on everything. And so people try to argue that, well, the Lutherans, they're so into law gospel um, that they don't have a use of the law outside of it showing you your sin or something. Um, and so Eric shows that's totally false. Right. Uh, Luther contradicts that. Uh, Melanchthon contradicts that. The uh, Formula Concord uh, contradicts that. Um, and this is not new material. <laughs> it's not like he's unearthing some long lost document. It's just we don't read each other. Um, the Lutherans don't read us very well, and the Reform don't read the Lutherans very well. <clears throat> um, Jordan, you you seem particularly excited about this chapter. <coughs> Um, I want to know what for you do you think jumped out the most to you as read this essay? Well, um, the last time I read it was when it when I first was given the book, and uh, I'm honestly just interested in the taxation and <laughs> the other chapters. So ah. I uh, I don't I don't remember too much honestly. Maybe Josh has <laughs> something. Yeah, I think what I would be interested in is because obviously um, Hutchison gives basic definitions of law from just the Western legal tradition, Plato, Aristotle, Cicero. Would the Reformed um, differ from Lutherans in their definition of law? You know, I, and I recently wrote a paper on Unius and his definition of law is just plugged from Thomas Aquinas's Summa. So is there any definition of law in regards to how that plays out in let's say a Lutheran political theory. Um, Cause to me at, at just looking at it first glance, I would see that maybe that, that could be a difference. Yeah. So one of the things that Eric's essay does is he gives you like so many possible ways to explain and define law. And so this is why some people hate our organization. Oh, here we go. TLDR nuance bros. Uh, I ain't reading all that, but <laughs> If you want to understand this, this time in history, you, you got to have a little patience, right? And so uh, Eric lays out uh, six possible um, senses of the word law, different ways that you might encounter it. And you, you have to admit this, right? Because sometimes the scriptures use law in the most basic sense of just morals, right and wrong. And then sometimes they use law in the term of the Torah. Um, so what, what Moses was given as a constitutional polity maker for Israel. But then sometimes law just means the Bible. <laughs> you know, yeah. Jesus would say, it's written in your law. And he's talking about Psalms. So you've got to be flexible with this. And uh, yeah, Eric shows at least six different ways that law might have a meaning in the scriptures. And then he talks about the various levels of the law, which I thought was really helpful. Um, it's not only an external code, but the law is also the sort of thing that you're supposed to meditate on day and night. Uh, so that you're like a tree planted by the mm -hmm. water, right? Um, you're supposed to internally digest it so that it's working on your spirit. And that's a really different way than like a modern American to talk about the <laughs> law, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, if you go to law school today and you uh, are that moved by the, the constitution and canons, then <laughs> <laughs> it might be wrong with you. Yeah. So all of that's before you even get to things like the three uses of the law. So when he finally gives a definition that you're expecting, uh, he says what the eternal and immovable wisdom and rule of righteousness in God, distinguishing between right and wrong and exercising wrath against the stubborn uh, revealed to us afterwards. So that kind of a definition struck me as pretty, pretty Thomistic, honestly. Mm -hmm. 
But I think what, um, and that's coming from Melanchthon, so that's not a huge surprise. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But I think what Eric's trying to do is say, to get the full understanding, um, you don't choose one of those. Like all that I just said, it's not like, well, you pick the one you like and forget the rest. They all stay together. Hmm. And so if you're writing one kind of book, you're making one kind of argument, then you may favor one of those emphases. But really for the whole life of the Christian, you need them all. And so, no, I don't think there's going to be a huge argument from the Reformed contrary mm -hmm. to that, um, at least until you're getting very modern, right? Okay. Uh, by the time you get to the late 19th or the 20th century, sure, the Reformed are going to start talking differently. Even in Bavink, you know, sad to say, we love mm -hmm. our man Herman, but uh, he's already reflective of some of these trends and changes. But you won't see Ursinus making a fuss about this issue. Um, he's going to say that they're all in agreement on this. Um, another thing about this essay that um, I thought was super helpful, beginning, beginning on page uh, six in a section on the levels of the law, he kind of talks about three, three levels of the law. And, and the first is that, well, the law requires the outward conformity <coughs> of the body, right? So the law you know, don't kill. So my bot, my hand, you know, doesn't get the ax and kill the guy. Uh, but then Melanchthon kind of develops that. And he's like, well, then just from philosophy, we know law doesn't only govern our outward uh, actions, but also our inward actions and, and our affections and our, our intent. The law governs that. And it's like, okay, well, that's, that's, you know, we can know that from natural reason. But I think what's really helpful is, uh, down at the bottom of page seven, um, he, he quotes Melanchthon as saying, Melanchthon puts as follows, the law of God requires not only external deeds or the diligence in restraining the affections that philosophy speaks about, but commands that our nature as a whole obey God and that it have a firm knowledge of and burning love for God. Uh, for Melanchthon, this is what Paul means when he says the law is spiritual. It is more than political wisdom because it demands spiritual motions. Yep. That is, it demands that all our external actions originate in the unfeigned love, fear, uh, commanded in the first table of the Decalogue. So right there, um, he talks about, you know, the, the law isn't only demanding external actions, and in some sense, internal actions, but a complete call to internal change. And I think he kind of repeats that idea even clearer on page uh, 10, uh, when he says that the law, it does not simply enjoin what we should or should not do, but what sort of people we ought to be. Absolutely. Um, and I thought, I think that, I think that really challenged my own view of law as someone that's read, you know, a bit in natural law and trying to recover that and philosophy. Uh, and, you know, I, you know, I thought, I thought, yeah, the law calls for external actions and, and that makes sense. But I never really thought of the law in the sense of something that, that calls us to become something, right? Yeah. To be something we're not. And um, I, think, I think it makes a lot of sense just in line with, of course, the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the call to conformity is, an, is a call to, in, in some sense, impossibility uh, as a result of um, our, fallen, our fallen nature. Yes. Um, so... Yeah, I and mean, this thought, is why it's so practical. Possible. This is why it's so practical for folks who are going to be in church circles and they're trying to figure mm -hmm. out well, what do I do with law? Because you guys probably have encountered this so often. Um, you want to really study the law and then maybe apply it. <laughs> and people say, oh, no, no, no. You can't do that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're not under law. Nobody can keep it. Like we're not, we're not in the Old Testament anymore. And then you're immediately thrown into all these controversies. Okay, well, like, I don't actually want to be recreating the temple. That's not what I meant in the first place. And I'm not even really a theonomist. That's not what I'm on about. I'm just, I'm just trying to say, how do I take God's word and apply it today? And too often the modern church, um, even evangelicals and folks who call themselves reformed, they really only take the law in that negative condemning sense and then once you've been condemned, that it, the idea is that you then leave the law, right? You kind of you, you move out of the law and you're going somewhere else. Now, it's 
true. You can use that language. You're not under law. You're under grace. Uh, the law has killed you. The spirit's going to bring you back to life. But understanding the full meaning of the law means the spirit brings you to life and then starts helping you do what the law was telling you to do. And so in Romans, this is one thing that blew my mind. Um, I was teaching through Romans 7 and 8. And, uh, you know, 7, I'm feeling really confident. This makes tons of sense. That which I will to do, I cannot do. Law inside of me that's warring against my spirit. Who will deliver me? So that we got that, right? Uh, mm -hmm. We got R.C. Sproul lecture. Boom. Everybody knows yeah. the answer. And then I turn the page. And I'm in chapter 8. And I'm getting all excited about the end of chapter eight because I know what's coming, right? Uh, all things work together for the good. Yes. But you know what it says in chapter eight towards the beginning? It says that the Holy Spirit uh, brings you back to life, you know, this body of death that you've been delivered from. And it says, if you walk by the Spirit, uh, the righteous requirements of the law will be fulfilled in you. <laughs> And I was going through that and I thought, can I say that? Like, is that allowed? <laughs> and there's a lot of bad ways to teach that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of wrong ways to teach it, but there are proper ways to teach it. <laughs> and the Puritans are actually really good on this. Uh, my old uh, associate, Mark Jones, is very strong on that kind of a message. And here we have in Hutchinson's chapter, a Lutheran who is extremely strong on that message. <laughs> And he gives us some philosophical explanation for how it all works together. And, and I think that was probably one of the more, more shocking aspects for me, um, having done some reading and listen, really a lot of listening to modern Lutherans. And you know, I've heard Lutherans make statements like, well, when you preach, you can never end with mm -hmm. application because so that's adding more law at the end of your sermon. You just undid your whole gospel presentation. Um, I've even heard uh, just talking about liturgy with folks, right? You can't, you can't have anything after the benediction, like a, like a closing hymn or song or commission, because then that's yeah. ending with law when the, you know, the benediction's gospel oh, to let God's word go last. Yeah. Um, yeah. And kind of this, kind of this modern, um, I think, aversion to gospel commands, right? And I think that partly, at least in reform circles, probably comes out of maybe an overreaction to the whole federal vision uh, controversy um, kind of going yeah far as opposite as you, as you can yeah um, and even even so, before yeah. that you had reactions against the theonomists mm -hmm. so you, had, you had the whole sonship movement right that was really big in the 80s and the 90s so mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. yeah so uh, I, I was going to say something i know that hutchison doesn't talk about this in the book but like you mentioned people viewing the law as merely negative it's it's only condemning would you say that stems mm -hmm. just practically speaking from like and people do this similarly with government, like government is only, it's a, it's only to restrain evil and not to promote the good. Do you think that's a bad understanding of the origin of law being something that's just not, you know, established after man's fall, but it's prior to that. And it's connected to his beatitude, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's, they, people latch onto a partial truth. You know, Paul mm -hmm. says, uh, before the law came, I was alive. Ah, see, the law wasn't always there, mm -hmm. but um, it, one kind of law or one sense of law. So the law as a menace, as a, as a persecutor, as a whip, that is not original. And then when you're saved and brought under Christ, that's actually taken away. Um, and so when we experience negative consequences of the law as a Christian, it's not actually the curse of the covenant of works but it's, it's a loving discipline from a father who's perfecting us. Hmm. Yeah. Um, something I was thinking about earlier, uh, we're talking about, you know, the, the law being fulfilled in us. I, I was thinking about when I, when I first started to use um, the prayer book, so it was late high school, and a lot of the colleagues have this kind of theme in it of beseeching God to work in us, you know, to bring about holiness yeah. Um, or I think of the, um, what was the thing about it was, is in, is in the communion service of the prayer book after each command, um, Lord yeah. have mercy upon us, but then incline our hearts to keep this law. That's right. Uh, and I, I think, um, I mean, I think it's a good corrective to, I think a lot of modern day 
uh, antinomianism or just even antinomianism you see uh, in, in certain discussions about liturgy, right? Like, so like you see in some circles, like once you confess your sins at the beginning of service, you know, you can't be sad about your sin for the rest of the service, you know, and that, and that sort of thing. <laughs> right. um, but I think, yeah, I th- just practically speaking, the way the way of thinking about the law in that way, I think opens the door for you to learn to delight in the law of God, where you can be the Psalm 1 man who, uh, who understands that the law isn't just a minister of death, uh, but it is it is life when you when you walk in it. And, you know, it talks about the joy, the blessedness of the man who delights um, to do and to meditate on on the law of God. Um, and what this this perspective does, why it's the first chapter, is this then opens it up and gives you the right and the capability as a Christian to then use law in social political conversations right. <laughs> um, instead of being hounded out and dismissed and said, no, 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 we don't do that. <laughs> now we have an explanation for, yes, we can. Uh, and that's that's why it's such an important chapter. Um, I think this might be a good good time to transition over to um the chapter on uh taxation and and welfare okay Um, let me flip on over real quick here we go um which was written by i'm yeah uh alan calhoun yes um and uh so kind of the way this uh chapter is is set up is he kind of brings up uh, just a, a little short, you know, the state of things now when it comes to uh, uh, the idea of taxation and welfare. Um, and and what he decides to do is go into the history of both the Lutheran tradition, uh, the Calvinist tradition, uh, and then and then the the Anglican tradition, uh, and kind of kind of uh, walk through it um, in 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 ways that I found very surprising. I think I was expecting him just to kind of hang out. And you know the first, second generation Lutherans, first, second generation Reform, first, second generation Anglicans, and kind of look at how did how did they do it. He kind of traces the history of all three traditions into into the modern day yes. uh, through some through some later um, authors. Like he'll bring up Kuiper uh, when he talks about Calvin, uh, and he'll go all the way to Rowan Williams when it talks about when when it talks about Anglicanism. Um, and even talk about modern day Nordic countries when it comes to Lutheranism. So it was really, it was really a surprising uh, chapter uh, to talk about. But I think to, to prepare for this conversation, you know, coming at it from someone that grew up in uh, 21st century Republicanism and spent a lot of time listening to Ben Shapiro and Rand Paul um, mm-hmm. in, in my high school, in my high school years, you know, usually when I hear welfare and taxation, um, my typical emotional response is New Yorkers like, ah, taxation, welfare, these, these are the worst things ever. Um, so could you kind of <laughs> give us, why are we talking about taxation and welfare and the reformed? Weren't they, weren't all their early Protestants good libertarian capitalists like, like me? <laughs> no, I mean, that's, that's exactly the, the perspective so many of us are coming from. Um, it's funny to hear you say when you were growing up, it's Rand Paul. When I was coming up, it was Ron Paul. <laughs> well, so I meant to say Ron Paul. I was like, yeah, oh, I was oh, his, yeah. okay. I listened to some Rand, but I always thought I was always told Rand was the softer Ron Paul. You know, he it's he true. Was yeah. as hardcore as Ron softer, is. So. He he is the no no water in your coffee version. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think that the story here is is totally blurred and obscured by recent American politics. Now, you got to be careful because people, they love recent American politics. They're going to get really offended here. I'm just, I'm talking about what happened. I'm I'm not yet saying what's right or wrong, what's good or bad, but it's just a fact that what we think of as conservative Christians totally pivoted and reinvented their social and economic thinking in the 1980s. Is that late? Uh, people have it have a hard time understanding this, but when Jimmy Carter was elected, he was treated as the evangelical candidate, um, and there were books and headlines all about that. So right. it's not until Reagan that you start to get a change, 
Um, and then, but even Reagan is not all the way. I mean, he's just starting the conversation and then it, it works from there. Um, but prior to that, it's a much more complicated conversation. Um, I'm from Mississippi. The Southerners, especially the agrarians, uh, they were very much in favor of FDR and the New Deal. Uh, in fact, they looked at that as a, as a lifeline. Um, without it, they probably would have thought they were going to literally be wiped out. Um, my grandfather, <laughs> he went to his grave only voting Democrats. Um, and, and he was not uh, socially progressive and forward thinking. <laughs> wow. um, so it was just different. It, it was different. Um, and when you look at the history, right, with Luther, uh, what Alan Calhoun shows is Luther had this expansive place for what's called the community chest. Mm -hmm. You guys all played Monopoly, right? You know, the community. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's in Luther. Wow. Uh, yeah. And this is for schools, it's for churches, it's for poor relief. Hmm. Calvin has something similar. You'll often see treatments of Geneva. They're so terrible. They outlawed panhandling. But they outlawed panhandling and then said the diaconate has to take care of the poor. So, you know, it was a one two punch. And they could do all of this because there was no clear distinction, certainly not a separation. Well, I shouldn't say distinction. There was a, a distinction, but it was not an absolute like wall of separation between what they thought of as what the church does and what the civil you know, magistrate does. <clears throat> Those worlds totally overlapped. Um, and it wouldn't have even made any sense for you to say, well, oh, no, no, only the church does this. Like th that wouldn't have worked for them. Um, and this continues until more modern era. Now things get different and we've got to, you know, this is where Calhoun is so helpful here. We can't just say, all right, let's do Luther. Let's do Calvin. That's not going to work. Um, I think I could be wrong about this, but I think Geneva never got more than about 7,000 citizens wow. ever. Right. <laughs> So are you really going to try to do a Geneva style welfare state in a place that's got a hundred thousand, two million, you know, that just, it's just not even a, a smart idea to try. Mm -hmm. So you got to move forward. And that's where people like Kuiper are relevant. Here we're now post-industrial, we're in the Netherlands, we're in a pluralistic society. So Calhoun treats Kuiper and then he takes you into the English settlement and how they did things as well. So he's, he's broadening your options. Yeah, um, I think you, you brought up Kuiper and, and, and Calvin and then the diaconate, which I thought was probably one of the most interesting parts of this chapter where in, in Calvin's Geneva, the setting up of, of the di diaconate was kind of made to operate to both handle welfare for both those within the church and those with out, outside the church. And I think in some sense, when you still have an established religion in a land, right, the, the line between inside, outside church and uh, society, that's all Christian. Um, it's, it's a bit more blurry um, and maybe made a bit more sense in Geneva. But what I found really interesting is that, is that Kuiper uh, seems to think the necessity of the state to um, do some some level of uh, welfare is because of the failure of the Reformed Church to properly uh, apply the deacon. Uh, here it is mm -hmm. on page uh, 225. He says, Reform, Reform theology failed to work out the foundational idea behind the diaconate. So the diaconate was supposed to care for all the poor members of society. Um, so where where did Reform get this get the idea that uh, kind of the church uh, it's, the, it's the duty of the church and the diaconate to be the one that cares for the poor in the society uh, and not those with, within in the church. Um, and then on top of that, um, it, it, it does seem to me to be a, a, almost Constantinian in a way. Uh, I, I recently listened to um, uh, on the White Horse Inn, uh, Michael Horton actually had on Peter Whitehart to talk about uh, Constantinianism as a political idea. And one of the things that Whitehart brought up was, well, what one of the things Constantine did was he took a lot of cases outside the civil cases and gave them to become church cases so that, you know, the, the poor could be cared for. And it kind of, kind of seems to be a similar thing where you're giving uh, civic duties in the temporal kingdom to the church. Mm -hmm. um, 
So where, where did Reform get this idea for uh, using the diaconate in that way? Yeah, so with, with Kuiper, I do think you have a little different shade of what's happening. So for Calvin, um, I'm not saying Calvin would say, oh, they don't ever do it. But for Calvin, they're, they're primarily going to be doing it for the church. Mm-hmm. But it's a really tight knit city state and pretty much everybody in Geneva is in the church. So it, it's not as big of a, of a disparity. But what happens with Kuiper, um, and this is not often understood and discussed, Kuiper actually gives up. He, he allows for the, um, he gives up the idea of a totally unified establishment church um, after the old model you know, a full bore reform theocracy. Cal, uh, Kuiper actually, he, he, dis, he departs from that tradition. Now, people don't easily understand that because he's, he's still so active, right? He's, let's go get him. He's an aggressive, optimistic, social warrior. But what he does is he says, no, 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 that the basic palette has to be no, neutral. You've got to have this kind of empty space And then you fill the empty space with any number of spheres. So the spheres themselves are being put into a zone. The zone is neutral, but the spheres can be different. And so you can have this kind of sphere or that kind of sphere. And he wants the church to be one of these spheres. And the church comes into the the area and then it, it takes... Uh, an active role in discipling and cultivating and helping uh, bring the best uh, for all people in that area. So for Christians, they're going to become more Christian, but non-Christians are also going to receive common grace blessings. And you can't forget, right? Kuiper was Mr. Common Grace. People didn't always like that. That's one of the things that some of the other Dutch groups don't agree with. Um, and so if you're not Dutch, you never heard of any of this, but if you, if you are Dutch, then, then you're much. Uh, <laughs> and so you know what I'm talking about. Kuiper wanted to help the common sphere as well. Um, and I think the reason he had to talk this way is because he's in the 20th century. You know, the effects of liberalism, modernity. Uh, I mean, he's after the whole French re- revolution. Um, his predecessors were counter-revolutionaries. Uh, Bon Prinsterer and others like that. But by the time you get to Kuiper, that's all settled, right? It's not like two parties at war. They've all kind of worked things out. Um, And he creates what's called Christian democracy. So it's, um, it's very much comfortable with and sort of has made peace with uh, liberalism in the, the political sense. He's not an illiberal. Uh, He is, he is a liberal but he wants to be a Christian liberal. So that's Kuiper. And that's why he's different, but he's still totally involved and totally on the march, totally confident. And he wants Christianity to really take an ownership of that liberal space. Um, I think Can I, I ask think a more, question real quick? Oh, sorry, John, yeah. yeah, no, uh, I was just wondering if, just going back to Luther for a second, um, when he's talking about just poor relief and um, the community chest and all that, those kind of things, um, Calhoun says that uh, for Luther, the Lord's Supper erased the distinction between the sacred and the profane spheres. It served as Luther's paradigm of how God and God's word are always working for humankind in a materially mediated way. And so he goes on to talk about how like the Lord's Supper um, in some way as it spiritually nourishes us, it, it uh, physically nourishes us. And that's supposed to be this, this paradigm of how we as Christians are supposed to kind of uh, nourish other people and, and relieve, relieve the poor. And um, so he also just kind of talks about how like Luther, I think he says he ferociously exposed the way in which the debased forms of pre-Reformation piety reinforce the conditions of the poor by treating poverty and almsgiving as meritorious. And so I was just, I guess, wondering with all that together, you know, with Luther's view of the Lord's Supper versus maybe a more Roman Catholic view of the Lord's Supper, like how does that, how do you think, you know, this being a book on Protestant social 
theory rather than um, Catholic social theory, like where's the distinctions between Protestant and Catholic in, in this kind of area of, of giving and, and, you know, treatment of the poor? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> probably a lot more going on there than I could give a great answer right now. Um, but if you think about the, the Lord's Supper, this is an interesting template. For transubstantiation, um, modern Protestants, we just, we get stuck on the, the real presence conversation. Like that's just all that we do. But at the time of the Reformation, one of the things that the Protestants are very upset about and why they really had a problem with transubstantiation is transubstantiation gets rid of the original natural elements, right? The bread and the wine are no longer there. So Luther, even though he's definitely a real presence man, he still has the bread and the wine there. And so the idea was that transubstantiation is actually a case of grace uh, obliterating nature. Now, the Catholics would never admit that. They would never agree to that. They would, they would you know, fight me. But that's the Protestant argument is transubstantiation has obliterated nature and it's totally filled the zone with grace. And when you do that, then you end up defeating the purpose of grace because the thing you're here to help isn't here anymore, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, and then you turn poor relief into a meritorious work. And so that's a means to get something else right? So you're, you're just using the poor and then you get on past them. And it's not really a true love and a true case of charity, brother to brother. Um, it, it's sort of a tokenism or an instrumentalization, that sort of a thing. Um, and that's why middle uh, medieval piety was legalistic. And it was also sometimes kind of cruel, you know, it doesn't actually take a total interest in people like it should. Um, now I'm generalizing. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm just giving you the Luther argument here, <laughs> but I think that's all part of it. Yeah. That we want to use grace to heal and restore nature. And then that means the Christians are healing and restoring people. Something that I, that I found interesting, you can kind of say that Luther's understanding of welfare is an extension of his understanding of the Lord's Supper. Could you expound on that a little bit more? Yeah, well, so um, the Lord's Supper is a sacrament, but isn't it interesting the form that it takes, a community meal. And uh, the Lutherans, just like the Anglicans, Jonathan, um, they had this thing, uh, early era, where they would actually have the people come up and surround the table and so as they're using the chalice and as they maybe are using bread that uh, is ceremonial, they still preserve the idea that you're, you're eating a meal. You're having a meal together. And of course, mm -hmm. you reform guys know that the reform did that too. Uh, the Huguenots had tables you all sat at. Um, and we've lost that, unfortunately. But we can remind people that that is the idea. <laughs> that is what we're trying to do that God brings grace to us through the form of a communal meal. And this is why you can't come to the Lord's Supper if you don't like the other people at the table, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and this should remind you of the epistle to James. If someone's poor and hungry and you just say, hey, be warm and well-fed, God bless you, see you later, mm -hmm. then you're not doing it. You don't get mm -hmm. it. That's evil. And so here's your Lutheran two kingdoms, okay? This is Luther and the two kingdoms, the spiritual and the temporal. They are distinct. They do not totally take one over the other, but absolutely they interact with one another. And the spiritual has a transformative effect on the temporal. Mm -hmm. I, I have two thoughts. Um, first is going to be a quick aside, and then I want to get back to that. Uh, I think I think one another aspect to this, you know, differing in sac and understanding the Lord's Supper between you know Catholics and Lutherans and Reformed Anglican is is the rejection of you know the Catholic doctrine of uh, the Eucharistic sacrifice um, or a reworking into sacrifice praise and thanksgiving, right? Um, and when when you view the Eucharist primarily as a sacrifice and and man giving to God, 
right? Um, and then and God and kind of giving back where you might take it once in your lifetime, right? Um, kind of flipping that back over where the Lord's Supper is God hosting and, and giving to his guests. I think about, you know, in, in the original serum, right? You, you have a long paragraph prayer of really beseeching God to accept, you know, our sacrifice. And then when Cramer reworks that, it's all about, the once for all sacrifice offered and, and given. Um, oh, yeah. And I think that's, that's, it's a very, um, very telling of the way, uh, how, how you're going to apply your Eucharistic doctrine to your social doctrine, yeah. right? Where we, we come to receive, we come to give and that's God right. and God gives to all equally. And I think one of like this chapter is that he kind of highlights sacramentology in all three sections, right? He brings up how, you know, Calvin and Kuyper understand kind of the table as kind of the great level, 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 yeah. or where the rich, where, where the rich kind of, um, the poor kind of become humanized to the rich, right? Uh, and then he kind of alludes to sacraments in general in the Anglican section. But coming mm-hmm. back to that, he kind of talked about how in Lutheran sacrament, you know, Lutheran understand two kingdoms, the spiritual kingdom in some sets uh, uh, perfects or elevates or um, restores the natural kingdom yeah. and and i wonder do you think the lutheran understanding there is kind of an ecclesiocentrism where um uh the wh- wh- whereas i feel in in a lot of modern discussions of the two, two kingdoms um you have a spiritual and the nat in the natural and it kind of maintain their own lanes or yeah. in some sense the spiritual is a guest in the natural right. you, 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 you're listening to talking about it here with lutherans where the, the spiritual um, overcomes and elevates the natural. Yeah. So, so here, this is getting some, this is some old school Wedgworthism, right? So I'm going back yeah. in my old days. Here's the key. The two kingdoms are not ch- church and state. Like you've got to make this clear. The spiritual kingdom isn't even simply church unless you define church very carefully for Luther and Calvin and others, the spiritual kingdom is the invisible. It's the conscious. It's the, the God hits your heart through his word and his sacraments. That's the spiritual kingdom. And it's true that that's the church in the most proper sense of the term church, right? God's people, the elect, Um, that is the spiritual kingdom. But when you zoom out just a little bit to the physical assembly and then certainly the institutional bodies and denominations, well, now we've taken a step to the temporal. Uh, Calvin says this in his commentary on 1 Corinthians 11. He says, ecclesiastical polity is temporal and can be subject to laws of the temporal kingdom. And so church and state, those are not clear enough words that will mislead you if you talk that way these days. You need to say spiritual and temporal, internal, external, the heart versus relationships with others. Those are the real kingdoms. And so, of course, the sacraments are the crossroads of that, right? Um, You're only going to really get the sacraments on the heart level. But if you get them on the heart level, then absolutely, you're going to immediately be interfacing with everybody else in the room, all the people in church and covenant and throughout the rest of your life. And so getting that clear will will make so much more sense of of what you'll see in Luther and Calvin and others. Um, The modern understanding is a um, it's a distortion that comes from the circumstances of history. As the church is no longer establishment, then you don't talk about the whole community as being the church. You'd never say Orlando is my church. That would just that would be ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you could say that in um, in medieval Germany. You know, you could say that in Geneva. Uh, John Knox, right? Give me Scotland or I die. <laughs> so for them, when they they talked about church, they meant all the people who believe. Uh, and those people are all in this area, that sort of a thing. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, now Luther is not a radical transformationalist. You know, he doesn't want to bring heaven to earth um, and he's got wild mood swings. 
<laughs> so for all of his love of the poor, uh, if, if the peasants step out of line, watch out. <laughs> so it's not, it's, it's complicated, you know, it's back mm -hmm. and forth. It's not a one-to-one. -one. We're not uh, totally bringing down all of the hierarchies. But what we are doing is we are embodying the hierarchies in a new way. Mm -hmm. And we're using them for proper purposes. Yeah. That's, that's super helpful. Well, hey, uh, it looks like we've come right about to the end of our, our time today. So uh -huh. thank you so much for joining us. Thank you at home for uh, tuning in. I uh, just one last reminder, uh, check out the description. We have a link to process social teaching from Davin Institute. And you'll be able to uh, read many essays from Alistair Roberts, Matthew Lee Anderson, Bradley John, John Wyatt, and more. Uh, yeah. And uh, Steve has his own chapter in there uh, on uh, abortion. So I encourage you to go check that out. Um, and uh, with that, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about the book. And uh, thank you guys for uh, coming to have this conversation. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Bye-bye. Oh, wait, before we go, one more, one more, one quick thing, like subscribe, uh, and, um, please make sure to leave us the five-star review on Amazon and on Apple. And with that, we'll see y'all next time. Bye-bye.